Today, I'm driving an Escort with a boot, or am I? In the early 1980s, the world was going hatchback shaped and Ford was no exception. After two generations of three box saloon Escorts, the Mark III came out in 1980 and the hatchback was king. Even in 1985, the Granada, the king of the Ford range, became a hatchback. However, there was still demand. People still liked the old traditional look, the three box saloon, steadfast, steady, distinguished, grown up look. So in 1983, the Orion was born. Now it's very loud out here and I'm going to get inside the car because there's tons of traffic and I'll tell you the rest in... Ugh, sorry about that. After standing here doing the uh, static shots and details for the last few minutes in absolute silence, every car in South East England has decided to drive down that road. The Orion was always just a little bit more grown up, a bit more distinguished than the hatchback. So three years after Mark III Escort came out, in 1983, the three box saloon Mark I Orion came out. Interestingly, it always had that kind of space theme because codenamed Apollo during its development phase. And uh, after all, as we all later found out in Men in Black, the galaxy is on Orion. It's built. With the Mark I Orion, it was pure Escort at the front, with just a slightly revised grille, moving back through the same front doors as a five-door Escort, I think the same rear doors, but then it gets all a bit party around the back where the mullet grows, and then you've got the big old boot. And in fact, a contemporary Sierra is around the same length as this. You actually get more legroom in the Orion, which is interesting. At launch, it only came with a 1.6 litre and GL and gear trim. A year later, they dropped in a diesel and gave you an L trim for the basic entry. And being top spec, that meant all the cars got an electric windows, electric mirrors, sunroof, headrests, all the good toys. And then in 1986, when the Mark III Escort became the Mark IV Escort, although a lot of people kind of debate whether it really was a Mark IV because really it was just a Mark III facelift and some people call it the 3A, the 3.5 but yeah, for the ease of use we'll call it the Mark IV this became the Mark II Orion and as you'll notice it's now got the curvier front end the softer rounded headlights and the back it's got those tail lights with the black stripes through following on the design language from the Granada which kind of trickled down to the rest of the range if you look at the Sierras when they facelift around the turn of the decade and the Sapphire came out they too follow that similar kind of square but rounded edge design language. Which continues inside the car. Look at this dashboard, lots of straight lines, soft curves and durable materials. You can see where the 90s was going. And look at this seat fabric. It's a hard wearing tweedy wool, which is actually far more comfortable than it looks. And basically pretty much what you get if you didn't go for a gear with the velour. Here on the door card, get electric windows in the front and those weird rocker switch central locking things that Ford used for the entire 80s and a lot of the 1990s. And below that, big door bins in both front doors. Very handy indeed and a not so handy air vent, which seems to blow only on your knee because it's too low for the window or your face. Then we have these little stubby obelisk indicator and wiper switches on the left and right, and those rings for lights and I presume rear wipers if it was the Escort. These dials are an object lesson in legibility and clear design. Look at them, it's so easy to read, even if 140 miles an hour is a bit optimistic. And not much else in there, although there is a choke light. Yes, this car has got a choke manually in 1989. Now, you might recognize these buttons from a car we did at Christmas. Yes, and Aston Martin, and no, they are not made by Aston Martin in the first place. Then we have this horrible little four-way switch, which I've still hated since the 80s. And next to that, a manual choke, a manual choke in 1989. What were they thinking? Goodness me. And those Aston Martin buttons are for the rear fogs, the rear screen heater, and a blank for front fogs, I would assume. And over to the right, we have got electric mirrors because GL and luxury, and a coin tray. People loved a coin tray back in the 80s, didn't they? Now this heater control is a, another lesson in simple practical design. It doesn't do anything you don't need it to and it works beautifully. FM and auto reverse, height of luxury, and below that, 12 volt socket and litter tray. Now this cubby hole is a brilliant bit of design. Not only is it huge, but look at those little grooves at the front. They will hold half a dozen audio cassettes very handily. And the space behind that, made practical by holding the cassettes at the front, is bigger than a lot of cars' entire combined storage put together. But sticking with us for a minute, this is a really interesting piece of design. Ford have done their very best to try and disguise the fact that this kind of just truncates and ends suddenly with the heater blower motor just hanging there behind it. 20 years on, Volvo are making a feature out of a floating center console. Not trying to hide the fact it's a machine. And then we have five-speed gearbox, luxury and a car price point in the 1980s. And now the essentials, the tea shelf. This is good. It's got space for two mugs and a deep slosh rim. So if you have a big spillage, it won't go over your dashboard. But to the left, be careful. There's a drowning risk in this massive tea trough. Don't get lost in there. It's vast. And this glove box, not the biggest in the world, but this lid is a great picnic tray. How solid and big is that? Lovely. 
Now up in the ceiling, height of sophistication, digital clock and a courtesy light. And because GLs and gears all came with as a standard, we have a covered glass tilt slide sunroof, only manual, but hey, who's complaining at this price point? Let's look in the back. Now, as I said, more legroom than a Sierra. I haven't sat in the back of a Sierra in a very long time, but uh, this is actually really comfortable. The seat is deep and squishy on this same hard wearing um, fabric, but with nice padded foamy bits. But yes, I've got lots of room for my knees, loads of room for my feet, uh, decent headroom. This is really good. This is a really well thought out car. I remember my dad having one of these back in the 80s, and it, at the time I think he hated it because he came from a Carlton, which is a much nicer car to be fair. But I never remember being uncomfortable in the back of the car. Now carrying over from the Escort, although this doesn't completely open, this does actually open in two parts. It's a 60-40 folding rear seat, so you can get long loads through the boot into the back of the car, and these will fold relatively flat, so it's not a completely impractical proposition. As far as equipment for pack seat passengers goes, you've got um, a door handle, a window winder, and your same little wind out ashtray things I've mentioned before because they're huge fun. And uh, this is before iPads, we've played with these. And in terms of safety, you've got two three-point harnesses and a lap belt in the middle. Now this boot is actually a lot bigger than you might expect. It goes a very long way back, all the way to those seats, which aren't even folded down now. And it's deep enough to put you know, fairly sizable bags and cases and things in here. Um, and it's quite wide as well. And finally, Ford have got around to putting a lining around the edges, so you've not got direct access to the panel work. So you're sliding luggage. We'll have to bang quite hard to put a dent in it. It is only like compressed cardboard kind of stuff rather than anything modern and noise insulating particularly, but better than nothing. You've got a thin carpet on the bottom and you've got a full size spare wheel underneath. And that's kind of it really back here. Now here under the bonnet, we will find Ford's venerable CVH engine in 1398cc form fed by a Weber carburetor. It produces 74 horsepower and 109 newton meters of torque, which gives it 0 to 60 in 11.9 seconds and a top speed of 104 miles an hour, thanks in part to its drag CDA of 0.662. This car is currently for sale at Young and Partners near Maidstone in Kent, so please check out the link to their website below. Great little family Ford dealership. Maybe you can drive away in this this weekend. Well, the little 1.4 doesn't have masses of go, but it's not bad. It's not as quick as the 1.6. People in the know back in the day would buy it over the XR3i because um, it was the same engine, but with just a tiny bit less performance, and so you get away with phenomenally cheaper insurance because these didn't attract the same kind of people. These attract more grown-up family people rather than uh, boy racers and less people less likely to bling their cars up in an embarrassing manner. Well, it was very trendy then, but looking back, time hasn't always been quite so kind. Now the pedals are really light. The accelerator, you know, goes down smoothly. The clutch is almost no effort to push. And the gearbox is actually really quite easy to just glide through. A little too easy, you might say, because uh, it's a five-speed box and the 135 ratios are actually quite close together. So if you're not paying attention or if you're used to a car with a more widely spaced gearbox, it's not too difficult to inadvertently slide it from two to five rather than two to three, which is a little bit embarrassing. Now I have to say, I'm genuinely not sure whether this car's got power steering or not. I couldn't find anything on the specs relating to it. And I don't think Mark IV Escorts had it as standard from memory. But the wheel is so light, it could be power assisted, but at the same time, heavy enough that perhaps it couldn't. And it's got a nice kind of connected, direct feel to it that suggests it's probably not power steering. And I don't think Mark IVs did. I had a couple of Mark III's and IVs and I don't think any of them did. Even though the Orion always kind of plays second fiddle to the Escort, it still managed to make it into the top 10 selling cars in the UK between 1984 and 1990. So these things were massively popular because back then the three box saloon was just ingrained into society the same way that SUVs are now being drummed into kids of today as this is the thing you buy. Back then it's what your granddad drove, it's what your dad drove, so it's what you drove. If you wanted to be a grown up, you drove a saloon, not a hatchback. 
And even today in America, there's a generation that is still struggling to come to terms with four cylinders and front wheel drive, never mind five door hatchbacks. So the Focus, uh, I don't know if it still does it over there or not, but until recently, certainly had a, a saloon version of the Focus out there. But yeah, so this was built to kind of cater for that that look, that more distinguished, more elegant, more upmarket kind of section of the buying public. And it did well. I always thought it looked elegant. I always kind of preferred the look of an Orion over an Escort. And they carried it on for three generations. The first generation before this, this is the second generation. And of course, when the Mark V Escort came out, they Orionized that too. Sadly though, in I think 1993, probably for reasons of cost saving over anything else, they dropped the Orion name and made it all into Escort and Escort Saloon. I imagine just so they don't have to print so many brochures and so they can not have to make so many different badges, they can just rationalize it into one single range. So it's an interesting progression of how the car's shared design uh, moved on from the Mark III Escort with its square edges and sharp lines. It was a completely new and shocking thing, the Mark III Escort, after the very, very traditional Mark II. Even so, it's still being dictated by the design language of the early 80s or the late 70s when it was actually drawn. And so, as the 80s moved on and the style preferences changed to softer edges, which ultimately became the 90s very curvaceous egg-shaped cars almost, the Mark IV Escort slash Mark II Orion took on that same kind of softer edge look. And I think that was like the pinnacle of the design of the Escort range, really. I, maybe it's just my age or something, I don't know. But I always thought that that Mark IV Escort slash Mark II Orion was just kind of the, the nicest looking. It had that same exciting, clean, wedgy shape of the Mark III, but it just kind of softened into that 80s style, which is just kind of cool. And of course, by the time the 1989 car came out, there was a few more changes for the Mark II. It got better door locks. The originals were awful, and you could open them with a spoon. ABS became a thing across the range as well. Safety was becoming something you needed to talk about. Obviously, a 1989 car, no airbags here in the wheel or in the dashboard. That was a generation away still, at least. And also, of course, by the time this car came out, there were just so many different variations. You could get everything from a 1.6-litre diesel L, which is really painful poverty spec with wind up windows front and back up to the full blown RS versions of these things. A friend of mine did have, well, I, I, I say RS version. It was an RS body kitted 1.6. I'm not quite sure it was a genuine RS. I'll have to ask him later. But either way, in probably 1988 or 87, it must have looked absolutely fantastic. By the time he got it, well, it was still white. And in keeping with you know, cars of this generation, the ride is nice and supple. It's fairly soft in terms of springing. And uh, yeah, it's more of a relaxing, rolling into a bend ride rather than the gripping and refusing to roll the body kind of scary thing. So yeah, it kind of rolls gently into a corner with a bit of body lean rather than the more modern take on things, which is hard sprung. In keeping with this chassis, it doesn't really slip and slide, it grips pretty well. I'm not going to push it today, it's a dealer's car and it's wet and muddy out. But it feels sure footed and confident. It's the kind of car that you could give to a learner, well, they did give to learners <laughs> back in the day. And it's a nice thing to be piloting down the road. It gives you a sense of confidence that the car's not going to let go on an exciting corner halfway through. It's going to, if anything, it'll just understeer slightly rather than anything dramatic, it's a safe car to be in. With the extra weight over the back wheels from that long boot, it does have a slightly more penduluming-y feel to the way the car rides over, over bumps and things than on a regular Escort, which is interesting. With little 13-inch wheels and quite tall tyres, that also helps you know, soften the ride as well. If you step out of this car into a brand new Ford, you can really still tell, even though nothing is in any way the same, you can sort of sense the lineage, the way of where it's come from. Typical Ford CVH engine, it's a little bit rattly and raucous, but at the same time it revs quite willingly and pulls the car along really quite happily. And the more you drive it, the more you get used to that little kind of very tight gate on the gearbox, the better it gets. And actually, it seems a bit happier 
slightly higher speed rather than pottering around in traffic, to be honest. I have to say for the price, I think it's for sale at 2250 I think the price on this car is. It's a bit of a bargain. If I didn't have my eye on a couple of other cars already, and nowhere to put them already, I would be quite tempted to snap this up myself, to be perfectly honest. The thing which really is quite striking is that considering the age of this car, and it's like 1989, so it's got 30-odd years old, the condition is just incredible. And I know it's not a high mileage car, 53,000 miles, but the steering wheel's got virtually no wear on it. The dashboard is you know, no damage, no cracks, no nothing. The door cards, I mean, beyond a bit of dirt from where people have just left their elbows on there over many, many hot summers, um, it's unmarked. Just a few little kind of fingernail marks in this door handle, but that's kind of to be expected with this kind of plastic. It does mark a little bit easily. But the slightly soft touch rubber elbow pad still looks good. If you're wondering why I'm driving in a slightly or weird manner right now, it's because we're following a tractor at about 15 miles an hour. And it's just exactly in between the ratios of second and third of where the car wants to sit. Also, very much of its time is the color of this thing, this kind of minty metallic green, um, which kind of came into fashion in the 80s and then disappeared again. But if you look at a Mark 1 Focus from about, say, 98, 99, maybe even 2000, virtually the same color is back on those cars again. And then it vanished again for most of the early noughties. And I don't know if you can, I'm, I'm kind of got a feeling you can buy this color again on, uh, actually I'm not quite, not quite sure what car it would be on, but I'm fairly certain I've seen it on something more recently. It's almost like a 15 year cycle for this shade of metallic green. I quite like it actually, I've never had a green car. Well, thank you for jumping in with me in this uh, elongated Escort. My personal favourite of the Escort range, actually, the Mark II Orion. Of all the Escorts and Orions, this is my favourite body shape. It's just my, my, I don't know, my age or something. So, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed having a look around this car as much as I've enjoyed driving it. Um, if you've enjoyed it, hit like, please hit subscribe, and maybe I'll see you again next time.